Heavenly Father, as we um, begin this study, I ask that you would let the human reasoning and the, the human thoughts that I may have that are incorrect be set aside and allow your Holy Spirit to clearly convey these truths that God's people um, can be confronted with them, that they can test them and consider them in their own time through prayer and study. We want to recognize the significance of the history of the Millerite time period as it's being repeated here at the end of the world, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would allow us to do this. Please send your angels to be in attendance here, and let this be a presentation that is fully for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the title of this presentation is the Seven Thunders Summary, and we recently did a series in Boise, Idaho, where it was 13 parts, and the first six parts was identifying several of the places where, in inspiration, where we are taught that the history of the Millerite time period is repeated at the end of the world. And this subject, in my mind, I, I, I'm certain that what we share, any presentation, is sacred material. But some of these presentations seem much more solemn and serious than others, and this particular study is one of those. And this is a summary of about six hours in Boise, Idaho, and it prepares the platform for considering the 1843 chart in a present truth application at the end of the world, because we're suggesting that there are so many avenues where inspiration has said the history of the Millerite time period is repeated at the end, that you, once you recognize that soundly and clearly, then you understand that the 1843 chart was part of that experience, part of that history. Can you ask the question, does it have some kind of impact here at the end? So we're going to summarize about six hours worth of material in one, Lord willing, and uh, on page 54 is where we begin. From Great Controversy, page 393, it says, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And in Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, it says, when the third angel's message is pre preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation, and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power, or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. Two presentations ago, I, I believe, we read a quote where Sister White says, Some lines of prophecy the Lord has repeated. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. When we see a line of prophecy, it's important, but when we see that same history repeated in different illustrations, it takes on a greater importance. And one of the lines of prophecy, the line of prophecy that deals with the experience of God's people, has been illustrated in a variety of ways in inspiration. One of them is in the parable of the ten virgins. And on page 54, you all will see Sister White using a second line of prophecy to illustrate the history of the Millerite time period when the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled. So we're, as we read this, um, please note that um, Sister White is using Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, you have the three angels' messages, and she's using Revelation 14 and the historical fulfillment of the first, second, third angels' message of Revelation 14 as another line of prophecy to illustrate the fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. She's bringing these two themes together. She says, I was shown the interest which all heaven had in taking, taking in the work going on on earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare, prepare for his second coming. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth 
with his glory and warn men of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes receive the light. This is the first angel's message. But this is also the mighty angel that comes down in Revelation 10. But we, we, we're going to try tying that together. Another mighty angel was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to the earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is the second angel's message in the Millerite time period. As the people of God united in the cry of the second angel, the, host, the heavenly host marked with deepest interest the effect of the message. Jesus commissioned other angels to fly quickly to revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move which was soon to be made in heaven. What's the important move that was soon to be made in heaven? Christ moving from the holy to the most holy. Third angel's message. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission to aid in the second angel in his work. Now, she described the first angel's message, the second angel's message, and then she describes other angels that are going to come and help with the second angel's message. And notice how she identifies what these other angels that join with the second angels, what she says about them. A great light shone upon the people of God as the angels cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Here she's just tied the three angels' messages of the Millerite time period together with the parable of the ten virgins. This is two lines of prophetic history that are covering the same, um, the same history. They're emphasizing two things. So we're going to look closely at this history. Um, next page. If you mark... 1833, as the time period that William Miller began to proclaim this message, actually it was 1832, I point to 1833 because this is when he received his credentials to preach, which means very little to me, but it is noted in the history of William Miller that it was 1833 that he received his credentials, and it's also in 1833 where we had the, the uh, falling of the stars in fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ that would take place just before um, the return of the Lord. So we mark in this time period that we are setting forth here, we mark 1833, Great Controversy, page 333. In 1833, two years after Miller began to present his public, in public the evidence of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior as a token of his second advent. Said Jesus, the stars shall fall from heaven, Matthew 24, 29. And John in the Revelation declared as he beheld and visioned the scenes that should herald the day of God, the stars of heaven fell unto earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, which she is shaken when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Revelation 6.13. The prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric shower of November 13th, 1833. Notice where the center of the Advent movement is. Great Controversy 368. To William Miller and his co-laborers, it was given to preach the warning in America. This country became the center of the Great Advent movement. It was here that the prophecy of the first angel's message had its most direct fulfillment. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. Um, Wherever missionaries had penetrated in all the world were sent the glad tidings of Christ's speedy return far and wide spread the message of the everlasting gospel, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. The first angel's message, though it was established here in the United States, the first angel's message is carried around the world. This is a characteristic of the first angel's message. We'll pull that in to focus in just a moment, but I want to point it out to you as we move by. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested in this whole history. In the first, second, third angel's message, the power of the Holy Spirit was there throughout it. Um, Sister White says, A transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages as it attends the message of the third angel. Lasting convictions were made upon human minds. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. There was diligent study of scriptures point by point. Almost entire nights were devoted to earnest searching of the word. We searched the truth. As for hidden treasures, the Lord revealed himself to us. Light was shed on the prophecies, and we knew that we'd received divine instruction. How often have we known that we received divine instruction? How, how often has it been for you where you realized, the Lord just spoke to me out of his word? Um, when, you, when you know that, when you know that, um, it has a, an impact on your experience. 
Um, so let's look at this history more closely. Great Controversy 611. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844, we're going to put 1840 up here, and we'll go ahead out here. It's too bad I did such a crooked line, but we'll put 1844 over here because this is what we're going to be discussing. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message, and we're going to show you that this took place in 1840. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. And this is an important point to nail down. The first angel's message is the one that gets carried to the world, and we'll show you that the second angel's message gets carried to the United States. Two different characteristics in these two messages that are worth taking note of, because this is how inspiration identifies it. Next page. Great Controversy 334 and 335 tells us how the first angel's message was empowered. And the first angel's message began back here with William Miller. And uh, Sister White read a quote two years before 1833. I'd said one. But William Miller begins in 1831, falling to the stars, 1833. William Miller's giving his message for seven more years after the falling of the stars. And on this time, this side of 1840, if you went to a Millerite meeting, you know, 30, 40, 50 people would be listening to William Miller. But in 1840, something happens that changes the dynamics of Miller's message to where then, instead of having 30, 40, 50 people in his meetings, he had two or 3,000 people in his meetings. Something happened. And what happened is described in the Great Controversy. Page 334 through 335. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown in AD 1840, sometime in the month of August. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, he wrote a second track, allowing the first period, 150 years, to have been exactly fulfilled before Diakosis ascended the throne by permission of the Turks, and that the 391 years, 15 days, commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on August 11, 1840. And by the way, brothers and sisters, this is this history. What he's talking about the, is the time prophecies associated with the first and second woe, the fifth and sixth trumpet. They're illustrated here on the... Um, 1843 chart, and William Miller ha had at least three sermons where he dealt with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. This was a message of the Millerites, and Josiah Litch, what he did differently than, than Miller is he not only preached the, the future collapse of the Ottoman Empire, he put it in writing predicting that in August of 1840, in fulfillment of the time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days in Revelation 9, verse 15, that the Ottoman Empire would collapse. And as the time approached, just a few days before them, he even fine-tuned his calculation to the point where he said, not only will the Ottoman Empire collapse in August of 1840, but it's going to take place on August 11th, 1840. And in the next paragraph, Sister White says, at the very time specified, Turkey, well, the Ottoman Empire, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced. What were they convinced of? Were they convinced that Jesus was Lord, that, um, that Jesus was, well, Jesus was returning probably, but she says what the, the multitudes were convinced of. They were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus, a wonderful power was given to the Advent movement. Men in learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. What took place there, what empowered the first angel's message here, and it was empowered, if you want to get specific, on August 11th, 1840, 
what was confirmed before the world is that the year-day principle that William Miller was using to predict the second coming of Christ was accurate. And suddenly, the world who had not listened too closely to what William Miller was saying, they realized that the prophetic tool he was using worked. He predicted the collapse of the Ottoman Empire using that rule. And therefore, what William Miller was saying about 1843 was to be reckoned with. You need to, you need to start considering it from a different perspective. So that was when the first angel's message came into, hi- not, it came into history back here, but here's where the first angel's message is empowered, August 11th, 1840. The second angel's message came into history on, in um, June of 1842. It says here, in June 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, Maine. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. The closing of the door by the denominated churches is when the second angel's message has arrived in history. You have to ask yourself the question, did the Millerites understand that that was the second angel's message? And the answer is no. They didn't understand in June of 1842 that the second angel's message had arrived in history. It took them some time to figure that out. That's why there's places where Sister White says uh, the second angel's message was preached in 1843 and 1844. There's a place where she says in the summer of 1844 the second angel's message was preached. But technically, the second angel's message arrived in 1842. Um, you'll see the quote here that I just referenced, Sect- Selected Messages, Book 2 at 104. The first and second angels' messages were given in 1843 and 1844. That's when they were proclaimed. It's not when they arrived in history. And we are now under the proclamation of the third, but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. Notice what she says. It is just as essential now as ever before that they shall be repeated to those who are seeking for truth by pen and voice, we are to sound the proclamation showing their order and the applications of the prophecies that bring us to the third angel's message. There cannot be a third without a first and second. These messages, these messages here, this history, the messages that were fulfilled in this history is what she's speaking about. The first, second, third angel's message, and we've already referenced the fact that as she's understanding this history, she's setting out, out for us, Sister White, this is also the history where the parable of the ten virgins is fulfilled. This, in, this is the history that will re- be repeated again to the very letter, therefore. And as she's setting this out for us, here's what she says at the end of this quote. These messages we are to give to the world in publications, in discourses, showing in the line of prophetic history, this prophetic history, the things that have been and what? The things that will be. This prophetic history is the history of what was, and it's this history that tells us what will be. So when Sister White says the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be repeated to the very letter, this is just another way that she's saying it. You show, you show the people by discourses and by pen this history, and in doing so, show the people what has been and what will be. Is that not what it says to you? That's what it says. Uh, second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844, and it then had more direct applications to the churches of the United States. Now, brothers and sisters, it's very specific. The first angel's message uh, was carried to the world, but the second angel's message, the characteristic of the second angel's message is it's localized to the United States. You'll see why that's important to acknowledge as we continue on. Uh, hopefully you'll see. Um, William Miller, when did William Miller predict that all these things were going to come to an end? 1843. And if you get very close and look at that history, William Miller was using uh, the, the Jewish reckoning of time, of which there were two in the Bible. He was using one of them, where in reality, uh, when, when Miller, Miller and the Millerites put 1843 in this chart, 
they believed that 1843 began in the end of March 1843, and that year actually ended in March of 1844. This chart said 1843, but the Millerites, their bitter disappointment didn't set in until I think it was March 22nd, 1844. That was the very last day of this year that they could expect the Lord to return. But once March 21st, 1844 passed, this is what Sister White is speaking about, the tarrying time. As early as 1842, in this time period, 1842, the direction given in this prophecy, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, was, had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and Revelation. She's speaking about this chart. Because of Habakkuk, Charles Fitch came under conviction we need to make this chart. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. No one, however, then noticed in 1842 that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, a tarrying time, tarrying time is presented in the same prophecy. After the disappointment in 1843, after the disappointment, the scripture appeared very significant. The, they'd use, the Lord had used a scripture to motivate them to make a chart, and they didn't realize at first that in doing so, the very passage in the scriptures that they, the Lord had used to inspire them to make this chart also dealt with the tarrying, tarrying time that they were going to be confronted with at the first disappointment. After the disappointment, the scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. A portion of Ezekiel's prophecy also was a source of strength and comfort to believers. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. I will speak and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall no more prolonged. It shall be no more prolonged. They of the house of Israel shall say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come and he prophesy of times that are far off. Therefore, saying to them, Thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. Now, brothers and sisters, Sister White is saying that Habakkuk was used for the creation of this chart in 1842. But in 1843, and in reality, it's, we're, when we're saying the disappointment in 1843, this disappointment of 1843 is actually right down here at the very beginning of 1844. When the disappointment comes, it's in that time period that they look to the prophecies of Habakkuk again and the prophecy in Ezekiel. And what does it take to say to them? That, that you're in the tarrying time, but I'm not going to hold back the vision any longer. So here's the point. Now here's one of the points. You're supposed to show from prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. If the 1843 chart has an application to you and I here at the end of the world in, a, in fulfillment of a repeat of the Millerite history, when we finally are confronted with the light of the 1843 chart, as the Millerites were they, were, they were confronted with this chart right down here at the end, in 1843, beginning of 1844. And what does the message say to them at that time? The vision's no longer prolonged. And what was their vision? What was the message they were proclaiming? Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What is our vision? Our vision is the third angel's message, a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. When that history is repeated, and the information of the 1843 chart is once again understood by God's people, and Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12 once again becomes present truth, we know that we're right down here just short of the vision that we're proclaiming about the Sunday law. In other words, brothers and sisters, if what we're suggesting is true, the Sunday law is about to arrive, arrive in the United States and probation's about to close. Great Controversy 398. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had first been thought that the 2300 days would end and the autumn of the same year to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Now, when, this, when was this fulfilled? 
was fulfilled at the Exeter camp meeting in Exeter, Maine, in August, August 12th through 17th, 1844. The midnight cry arrives in history. And if you count the days from August, if they went out on August 18th, the day after the camp meeting closed, from August 18th until October 22nd, they proclaimed the midnight cry. How many days is that? Just a couple months, barely. September, October. Very short period of time. What happened in that short period of time? The next quote, the great controversy 400. Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. The midnight cry, the midnight cry right here is identifying an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Next page. The second angel's message here began in 1842, and the midnight cry is simply a, a, a secondary manifestation of the second angel's message. Remember we read where Sister White says, an angel, the first angel's message was commissioned. That was the first angel's message. Then a second angel. And then other angels were commissioned to join the second angel's message. And those other angels proclaimed, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That was our, like our third quote. The midnight cry is just a part two of the second angel's message. And the midnight cry is the part of the, the movement, the history that, where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place, and the midnight cry comes at the close of the second angel's message. Notice early writings, page 238. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voice of the angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. And uh, there's more to read in there, but this is this is an abbreviation of this study. So what, what I want you to see here is the midnight cry comes as the second angel's message is closing, and the second angel's message closes when the door is closed. You notice the, the subtitle on page 58 says, The door was shut, referring to Matthew 25, 10, 13, the parable of the ten virgin, virgins. There comes a point when the door is shut, and the door was shut on October 22nd, 1844. This was a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins. And uh, you'll notice a quote from Selected Messages, book 1, page 63, where Sister White says this, I was shown in vision and still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. So when you come to the close of the second angel's message, there's a door closed and... Uh, those people that had not passed the testing time of this history were left in perfect darkness. The door that was closed is also illustrated in Revelation 3, 7, and 8 in the message to the Philadelphian church where there is a door opened and a door closed. Go to the next page, and I'll try to, try to bring some of these thoughts together. Um, a process of purification. As the church is refused to receive the first angel's message, 1840. They rejected the light from heaven and fell from favor of God. They trusted to their own strength and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second angel's message. This is an escalating testing process. Next quote, early writings 56, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. And this is on October 22nd, 1844. This is the third part of the testing process. They're still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. He'd moved from the holy to the most holy. A Satan appeared to be by the throne trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was much light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. There's a purification process that goes on in this history. It's a threefold testing process. You need to receive the first message, the second message, in order to be prepared where you can pass the third message. It's a purification process, and the, the, the most significant aspect of the purification process takes place here in the second angel's message. That's why 
in Crest Collection, page 114, Sister White says he, Christ, will purify his church even as he purified the temple at the beginning and close of his ministry. Here, Sister White is saying that there's a twofold cleansing process that comes to God's church that has been prefigured by the two times that Christ cleansed the temple. And then in Selected Messages, book 2, page 118, she says, When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So, in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In the second angel's message, Christ cleansed his church at the end of the world for the first time. Then she says, And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. And so couple things there. It's in the second and the fourth angel's message where the cleansing process takes place and the loud cry of the fourth angel's message it comes when the other voice of Revelation 18 says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. We'll deal with that in a moment. Review and Herald, October 31st, 1899. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the f- messages of the first and second angel's Refuse the third, the last testing message to be given to the world, and a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. This purification process is repeated. It's repeated. This whole history is repeated to the very letter. The midnight cry repeated. There is a world lying in wickedness and deception and delusion in the very shadow of death, asleep, asleep. Who are feeling travail of soul to awaken them? What voice can reach them? My mind was carried to the future, When the signal will be given, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing the lamps. Brothers and sisters, what does oil represent in the parable of the ten virgins? Usually, Seventh-day Adventists say the Holy Spirit, which is correct. But let's read the rest of this. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps, and too late they will find that character, which is represented by the oil, is not transferable. This is about a purification process that identifies character development. The shut door repeated. Manuscript releases, volume 16, page 270. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself, and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. Sister White here is saying everything in the parable of the ten virgins, the oil, the lamps, the virgins, uh, the time period, the bridegroom, needs to be understood, but what she emphasizes above all others is that a time comes when the door will be shut. Second place where this history is illustrated as being repeated is found in Revelation chapter 10. And in Revelation chapter 10, um, we have Revelation on page 60, you have Revelation 10 in its entirety under this title of the seven thunders. And then at the bottom of the page, you have a statement that's found in the Ellen White Study Bible on Revelation 10, which I've titled The Mighty Angel from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971 where Sister White comments on Revelation 10. So <clears throat> if you have that in the record, I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to assume that as students of prophecy, you will test what you're hearing at this point, but we're going to deal with Revelation 10. We're going to take Revelation 10 and, and overlay it as another line of prophecy upon this history. What line of prophecy? We're saying this. We're saying that from 1840 to 1844, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter and that it will be repeated again to the very letter. We're saying another line of prophecy is that during this history, the first, second, and third angel's message arrived in history. And in the second angel's message, it includes the midnight cry. So we have two lines of prophecy. Revelation 14, the three angel's messages, the parable of the ten virgins, we're going to also include in this line of prophecy Revelation 10, and in Revelation 10, verse 1, there's a mighty angel that comes down out of heaven, and he puts his foot upon the sea and his other foot upon the land, and he has in his hand open a little book. And in the comments from Sister White that you have with you, she identifies that the fact that the angel puts his foot upon the land and the sea is identifying a message that is carried to the world. 
She says this mighty angel that comes down is none other than Christ. And the book that's open in his hand is the book of Daniel. And what, what she is identifying is that on August 11, 1840, Christ came down out of heaven and empowered the book of Daniel. How did he do it? By confirming the year-day, pro- year-day principle of Bible prophecy with the fulfillment of Revelation 9.15, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and suddenly Christ had empowered the book of Daniel for all the world to see. And we have a book that, we're, that we handle that goes over, it's the best book on the history of the Millerite movement, written by a theologian in Andrews, Dam Steed. And he, he documents the history before and during this time period, and he demonstrates that in 1840, when the collapse of the Ottoman Empire arrived, that the Millerites already had the pamphlets and the tracts explaining their message already printed and in the boats, in the docks, in the ports on the west coast and the east coast of the United States. And truly, it wasn't just hypothetically, truly, in August of 1840, the Millerite message was carried to every mission station in the world. And that's what Sister White says, and it really took place. When Christ came down in Revelation 10, he's identifying when the first angel's message was carried to the world. Of course, we all know as Seventh-day Adventists what's being illustrated in verse 10 of Revelation 10. What's being illustrated in verse 10 is that Daniel takes that little book of Daniel that Christ has open in his hand and he eats it and it's sweet in his mouth, becomes bitter in his stomach. When did the little book become bitter in Daniel's stomach? August 22nd, 1844. So, so the first verse of, of Revelation 10 is when the first angel's message arrived in history, August 11th, 1840. And the, almost the last verse brings us to verse to October 22nd. But what is the last verse? The last verse after the bitter disappointment for John, the last verse in Revelation 10 says, and he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10 lays out the history from August 11th, 1840 until October 22nd, 1844. And then John says, this has all got to happen again. That's why Sister White says, in this history, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter, and it will be repeated again to the very letter. This is the third place where we're dealing with this history. We're dealing with Revelation 10, with the parable of the ten virgins and the three angels' messages, but there's another place, and it's in verse 4 of Revelation 10. If you look at verse 4 of Revelation 10, it says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And in your notes, in the comment from Sister White on Revelation 10, she tells us what the seven thunders are. She says, The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Brothers and sisters, The seven thunders is the events that took place from August 11th, 1840. That's the first angel's message. And then the second angel's message is June 1842. And the third angel's message is October 22nd, 1844. Sister White says the seven thunders represent the history of the of the delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's message. That's this history, 1840. 1844. That's what the seven thunders in verse 4 of Revelation 10 represent. And in verse 4, what was John told to do? Seal up that information. And in the comment by Sister White, she says one other thing about the seven thunders. She says, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events, which will be disclosed in their order. The seven thunders not only represent the delineation of events that took place from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844, they also represent future events that will be disclosed in their order. That's four lines of prophecy that are teaching that the history of the Millerite movement is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world. Um, so, if you turn to, 
uh, page 63. I'm not dogmatic about this, but um, in the comments by Sister White, on the bottom of page 63, on the comments of, by Sister White from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, where she's dealing with Revelation 10, she identifies that the seven thunders represent the history of 1840 to 1844, and at the same time she identifies that it represents future events. But in both those quotes, where under the title on the bottom of page 63, it says the seven thunders represent events, in both those places where Sister White's making those statements, she's saying the seven thunders represent events, whether it's the events of 1840 to 1844 or future events. Therefore, I suggest to you that the seven thunders or the seven events that took place in this time period is number one, the first angel's message, August 11th, 1840. The second angel's message, June 1842. The first disappointment, March 21st, 1844. The tarrying time, the spring, 1844. All these things have been identified by history and prophecy. Summer 1844, second angel's message proclaimed. August 12th through 17th, the Exeter camp meeting, the midnight cry arrives in history. October 22nd, 1844, the disappointment. There's your seven events that prophecy identifies that took place in that history that is represented by seven thunders. Now, if someone wants to argue that that's personal speculation, argue away. It's, it's, it, there's those events still are going to be repeated at the end of the world. Now, brothers and sisters, turn to Revelation 22, 11. Um, it's on page 64 of your notes, but it's, it's worth... Just looking at this straight out of God's word and thinking, thinking this through for yourselves. As Seventh-day Adventists, we all know what verse 11 of Revelation 22 is. It is, says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Brothers and sisters, this is the pronouncement that Christ makes when human probation closes. The books of Daniel and Revelation go together. In Daniel 12.1, Michael stands up and human probation closes. In Revelation 22.11... We are informed what Michael says when he stands up. When Michael stands up in Daniel 12, 1, this is what he says. These are the two places in the scriptures where the close of probation is very specifically nailed down for us. Verse 11 in, Daniel, in Revelation 22 is the close of probation. And look at verse 10. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. What book? What book are we in? The book of Revelation. There is only one prophecy in the book of Revelation that has been sealed. It says, seal not the, the sayings of the prophecy of this book, of Revelation, for the time is at hand. What time? The time when it's going to be unsealed. There comes a time, and when is that time? It comes a time just before human probation closes where the line of the tribe of Jesus, Judah, Jesus Christ, unseals the prophecy in the book of Revelation that's been sealed up. And what is that prophecy? The seven thunders. And what is that history? What is that truth? It's the history of the Millerite time period, but it's not simply the history of the Millerite time period. It is the truth that the history of the Millerite time period identifies the history of the development of the 144,000. And when we reach a time period when God's people begin to understand that the seven thunders represent the history of the Millerite time period that is repeated at the end of the world, when we reach that time period where there are people in Adventism that are recognizing that and proclaiming it, do you know what it means? It means probation's about to close. That's what it means. And it means that we need to come to understand what, the, what light the Millerite time period has for us here at the end of the world. That's what it means, brothers and sisters. If you, have another, if you have another understanding that seems more reasonable, you tell me what it is. It's not there. It's very simple. It's very clear. We've reached that time. Middle of page 64. It says, just before the close of probation, the subtitle. And then you have 20, Revelation 22, 10, and 11. And then Sister White says in Evangelism, page 195. The book of Revelation must be open to the people. Many have been taught that it is a sealed book. 
but it is sealed only to those who reject light and truth. The Revelation is a sealed book. Next quote, Signs of the Times, January 11, 1899. The Revelation is a sealed book, but it is also an open book, recording marvelous events to, that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. Its teachings are definite, not mystical and unintelligible, and God would have us understand it. Now, brothers and sisters, there's another angel that comes down. Look at Revelation 18, if you would. In Revelation 18, verse 1 and onward, we see the fourth angel. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the fourth angel's message is the message that we are waiting for. This is the loud cry, latter rain message. This is where the final call out of Babylon takes place, human probation closes, and seven last plagues come. Jesus returns, and we go home for eternity with our Lord. But we have, by and large, have missed that the fourth angel's message is two parts. It's two parts. Let's read it. Verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. That's another angel, right? Mark that. Having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Does this angel lighten the United States with his glory, or does he lighten the earth with his glory? This angel lightens the whole earth. Remember, the angel that comes down in Revelation 10 in fulfillment of the first angel's message had his foot upon the land and the sea, and he lightened the whole earth with his glory. This is a parallel to Revelation 10, verse 1. It says, He comes down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, for all nations have drunk, the wine, drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now notice this. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. Here's another voice. And brothers and sisters, at Seventh-day Adventists, how many of you have heard the loud cry of the fourth angel's message? How many have heard that term? If you look up the term, the loud cry of the fourth angel's message, it's the other voice that Sister White says is a loud cry. It's not when the angel comes down in Revelation 18, 1 through 3. That's not the loud cry. The loud cry, and we've already read a quote in this presentation, the loud cry is when the pronouncement goes, come out of her, my people, be not, you, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. And do you know that inspiration is very clear when the loud cry takes place? When does the loud cry take place? can show it through you in inspiration. Have it in the notes, but I think I may be running out of time. The loud cry... At the Sunday law, that's right, brother, at the Sunday law. So what do we have here? We have this. The fourth angel's message comes in two parts. The first part lightens the earth with its glory, and the second part takes place at the Sunday law in the United States. The first angel's message of 1840 was carried to the entire world, but the second angel's message of 1842 to 1844 where was it fulfilled? In the United States. In the second angel's message, um, in the Millerite time period, from 1842 to 1844, the Holy Spirit was poured out in the time period that we call the midnight cry. And in the second part of the fourth angel's message, which we call the loud cry at the Sunday law in the United States, the Holy Spirit is poured out in the loud cry time period. This history of the Millerites that we have been told is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world is the history that is represented in the fourth angel's message with the angel that lightens the earth with his glory and the other voice. Now, brothers and sisters, when you back up, what was it that empowered the first angel's message? What was it prophetically? It was a prophecy predicting the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And in Bible prophecy, where did the Ottoman Empire come from? The bottomless pit. So the first angel's message was empowered when a power from Bible prophecy that came from the bottomless pit, Islam, collapsed. And brothers and sisters, in Daniel 11, verse 40, a power from the bottomless pit, not Islam, atheism, collapsed in 1989, and the whole world knew it. Verse 41, the very next verse, is describing a Sunday law in the United States. Brothers and sisters, 
the angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1989. And we're now rapidly approaching the Sunday law in the United States. And Sister White said we are to sh show from this history what has been and what will be. And brothers and sisters, you're seeing a little bit of that from, from using that principle. Um, go to page 67. I'm passing over. If you read very carefully the quotes on page 65, 66, you'll see that Sister White is very specific that the loud cry is this other voice of Revelation 14. And also you will see that the loud cry begins at the Sunday Law in the United States. But notice um, on page 67 under the, the subtitle, the midnight cry parallels the loud cry, and then it says the first and second angel's messages run parallel, parallel with the fourth. We're saying this history of the first and second angel's message that it parallels the fourth angel's message because the first part of the fourth angel's message is a worldwide application. The whole world seen the collapse of the Soviet Union and Seventh-day Adventists were in a Laodicean condition so they didn't do anything about it. But they had opportunity to proclaim it to the world whereas in the Millerite time period they were not Laodiceans, they were Philadelphians. They carried the ball, we dropped the ball. But the potential was to carry this message to the world in 1989 but we didn't. The next part, the second angel's message is the call out of Babylon where the Holy Spirit is poured out. So we're saying that the fourth angel's message, the two parts of it parallel this history. And here's what Sister Wright says. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 in their place in the line of prophecy and their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angel's messages are still true for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. We just did that. We just gave you the history of the first and second angel's message and showed you that it parallels the future history, the current history of the fourth angel's message. The third angel proclaims his warning with a loud voice. After these things, said John, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this illumination, the light of all three messages is combined. You're supposed to combine this history with the history of the fourth angel's message. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 949, says the great message combining the first, second, and third angel's message is to be given to the world. This is the burden of our work. I knew that it would be difficult to summarize six hours of the Boise meeting into one hour. All right, it's just, that's beyond my ability. Um, so what I want to say to you in closing is this. this. This particular subject of the importance of the truth that the Millerite time period is repeated to the very letter is one that I would suggest that all of you, including myself, need to investigate very, very thoroughly. And in the Boise meetings, we give a very s slow, complete presentation of this truth. And this truth is what prepares the way for the rest of our studies this weekend. And it's this. Once you realize all the avenues that the Holy Spirit has emphasized to us, that the history of 1840 to 1844 is nothing more than an illustration of the time period when the 144,000 are developed. And then you look very closely at that history and you see that this chart was purposely brought about by the Lord through a passage in Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12. And you see the, the impact, the role, the purpose that this chart had in this history. Then you have a very strong argument to suggest that as this history is repeated, this chart will once again have a role to play in this final fulfillment of history. And Sister White says in early writings, page 74, that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. And I would suggest to you that there isn't any illustration on this chart that doesn't have a direct bearing to the correct understanding of Daniel and Revelation here at the end of the world and that there are teachings in Adventism today that totally destroy the understanding of that chart 
and that it is this chart, the information that is represented on this chart that allows us to bring the final warning message into focus and the final warning message in several places in Scripture is that what's about to take place on planet Earth is that a Sunday law is going to hit in the United States. There's a lot of ways to show that. But the only way that you can show it clearly and conclusively with, without any wiggle room for the adversaries is if you build that prophetic testimony on the foundations that were raised up by the pioneers of Adventism, and those foundations are all set forth on this chart. And that's what we're going to begin to look at in our following study. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, we have a burden at this point in Earth's history to write the vision and make it plain that he who readeth may run. And we understand that the vision is that you're about ready to finish your work as high priest in the most holy place and you're calling your people to holy living to an experience that qualifies them to be among the 144,000. And we understand that prophecy is telling us that you're giving this final call to the marriage, but you're giving it to a people that are asleep. Laodiceans. A valley of dry bones, as Ezekiel 37 says. Lord, this, this message can do nothing unless your Holy Spirit empowers it that it might be a tool to awaken us, and we ask that you would do this very thing, and wherever um, this material may go from uh, this humble beginning, we ask that your Holy Spirit would accompany, us, accompany it to, to wake up the sleeping virgins and prepare them to run with this message while we still have opportunity to do in fairly easy times. For we know in the very near future, everything is going to turn into hard times, and we thank you for the privilege of being among those that have seen this light as it's growing and coming into focus here at the end. In Jesus' name, amen.